when you look between the lines of the Sharia discourse, what is the preference, what is the tendency of the teachings of this deen? To work in the direction of setting people free, giving people liberation. It's not interested in creating a situation where more people are available. Islam is actually fundamentally looking to move in a direction away from human trafficking. That's the essence of Islam. But we have to read between the lines. When we read between the lines, we find some really interesting uh, information there. We find that كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَّى All children of Adam make mistakes. All children of Adam are going to sin. And the best of those who sin are the ones who make repentance, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's just this problem in the fiqh books. How many expiations for mistakes that Muslims made are tied to setting somebody free? If, it, if we're going into the business of buying and selling human beings, right, we're going into the slave business, Islam is not the right deen. Right? Because it's set up to internally just let people go and let people go and let people go. You do this wrong, well, you got to let somebody go. You do this wrong, well, the only way out is to let somebody go. SubhanAllah. So Islam prefers liberation. Moving on, he says to the Prophet والسلام, what if I don't do that? Meaning, what if I'm unable to do such things? He said, You help someone, you help a craftsman, or you help someone, or you engage in craftsmanship for someone who doesn't have skills. Right? To help someone with their labor, to help someone with their business. Right? Meaning the business that they're about, right, during the day. So if someone's trying to get onto his horse, you help him up onto his horse. If someone's trying to load their groceries into their car, right, you help them get their groceries into their car. Right? Imagine what would happen if you like went out to the Safeway parking lot and some old lady's trying to get all the groceries in the car and you came and you started taking a hold of her groceries out of the basket and trying to put them in her car for it, she'd probably lose her mind. Especially if your beard is too long. No. Or you're wearing a hijab. But subhanAllah, that's what it is. You help someone who already has skills, so you aid in advancing their cause. Or you bring your skills to bear for someone who doesn't have skills. That's the meaning of akhraq. Right? So you have a man who's akhraq and you have a woman who's kharqa, meaning that they're unskilled. Qultu, he said, Messenger of Allah, Ara'ayta in da'uftu an ba'adhi al-amal? What do you see if I'm not even able to do any of that? What can I do? What's left for me of goodness to do? And it's as if he's asking on the behalf of others. He said, Tukuffu sharraka anin nasi. فَإِنَّهَا صَدَقَةٌ مِنْكَ عَلَى نَفْسِكَ تَكُفُّ شَرَّكَ That you withhold or prevent your own evil from other people. Your own bad behavior, you protect other people from it. Interesting. Clearly Abu Dhar is speaking on behalf of people. He's not necessarily speaking about his own particular situation. And the Prophet ﷺ is using the word you, not particularly for Abu Dhar, but in general. Your shah, in general. All of us probably have a bad side, right? All of us could probably be a little bit annoying, okay? Or even harmful if we let our egos go. And if we're not paying attention, if we're not on our toes, subhanAllah, um, we can unwittingly 
or because of our, our just that we don't pay attention, we're doing harm to others. So to keep your harm from hurting another person. And there's two types of sin in Islam. We talk about the major sins and we talk about the minor sins. But there's also sins in Islam, another way of categorizing sin, and that is a sin with two victims or more, and a sin that only has one victim. A sin with only one victim is the sins that we do ourselves, right? and we're the ones who get hurt by that. Or something that directly violates what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects of His slaves. We've talked before about how you can't hurt Allah, okay? you only hurt yourself. But then there are this other category of sins with two or more victims, meaning we hurt ourselves, we hurt other people too. This is a worse situation. And here's what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is it if you're not able to do something or give something to others as your form of doing good and sadaqah, then keep others from being harmed by you and that will be a sadaqah, the reward for which will come back to you. Subhanallah. Muttafaqun alayh, agreed upon by both Bukhari and Muslim. And in the second hadith, also from Abi Dhar, that the Messenger alayhi salat wa salam said, Yusbihu ala kulli sulama min ahadikum sadaqa. Every day, hmm? Every joint of each one of you owes a charity, meaning every aspect of your being, every movement. The joint of your body, your arms and your feet and your legs and so on, is part and parcel of your ability to move your limbs. So each of your movements and actions that you do with your footsteps and your glances and your speech hmm? during the day, a sadaqah is owed, subhanAllah. Yusbihu, when you wake up every morning, khalas. What type of good are you going to do this day? Because that's what you're, what's expected of you. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects of the believer and really expects of the human being. Because the teachings of Islam are for every human being, not just those who have taken the first step, which is to accept faith. So it also gives you an understanding of your purpose in the earth, to either be doing good or making sure that we at least do no harm. Huh? So a sadaqah is owed, but then... He spells it out in a way that makes it easier for everyone. فَكُلُّ تَسْبِيحَةٍ sadaqa. Every subhanallah that you say is a sadaqa. And every alhamdulillah that you say is a sadaqa. And every la ilaha illallah that you say is a sadaqa. And every Allahu Akbar that you say is a sadaqa. وَأَمْرٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ sadaqa. الْأَمْرُ بالمعروف. Commanding what's right. Ma'roof comes from urf. Urf is what is recognized by people to be good. I found this on the web. So it's goodness, right, is what is owed. It's goodness that is, that is what is owed. Commanding, enjoining, encouraging. Does that mean literally commanding what is right, right is all of the obligation of Sharia law, so we're supposed to run around the streets wagging our finger at people and pointing at them, forgetting the fact that every time I point a person, I point my finger at someone else for more or pointing back at me. Huh? Or is it that we are encouraging, making half incitement to what is good, what is goodness, <coughs> what is positive in the earth, 
And in that is a sadaqa, encouraging people to make right choices, encouraging people to do things the right way. If we witness a situation where someone's bad behavior is going to have negative repercussions on the lives of others, maybe we can come up with clever ways to convince them in the way that convinces that particular person to maybe choose a different course of action, even if they don't even realize what we're trying to convince them of. And in this is an amr bil ma'roof, right? Is an encouragement to do what is ma'roof fi urf al nas, what is good in the urf of the nas. Let's expand these understandings. Hmm? Maybe to the way they were essentially understood by previous decades or previous centuries and generations of Muslims when they knew what Arabic language was, when they would meet people who had understood the conduct and behavior of the Prophet in their daily lives. In their landscape, in their environment, they encounter these people. Is there anybody that could help Sister Asma? So she's not the only one doing that? Right? Babu Kethrati Turuk al Khayr, the chapter of so many ways to do good in Islam. SubhanAllah. Barakallah fikum. Allah yuzdikum al Khayr, Sister Asma. Tayyib. So, commanding what is good. What type of munkar is there out there? Look how many people come to Juma on Friday compared to how many people come out to Fajr in the morning. Okay. Let's also look at the fact that we have public schools that are not as well supported as public schools in other areas of the country. Look at the fact that there are glass ceilings that prevent other people from uh, achieving all that can be achieved in a country like America for no good reason. That's also munkar. There's a lot of munkar out there, but we tend to be fixated on vice or just the routines of ibadat and comparing our ibadat to other people's ibadat. Well, we're going to come back to this whole idea as we proceed with these ahadith. Maybe we need to reassess what munkar is. Remind me, we'll come back to that. Wa yujzi'u min thalika rak'atani yarka'ahuma min al And a person can achieve all of this if they just pray two raka'at of duha prayer. SubhanAllah. We could do six duha. We could do eight duha. Or I could get two in. Right? SubhanAllah. And two is better than none if I don't have time for six. No. SubhanAllah. The next hadith, also from Abu Dhar, very interested in how to do good. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, عُرِدَتْ عَلَيَّ أَعْمَالُ أُمَّتِي حَسَنُهَا وَسَيِّئُهَا فَوَجَدْتُ فِي مَحَاسِنِ أَعْمَالِهَا الْأَذَى يُمَعْتُ عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ All of the actions of my Ummah were shown to me. The good actions as well as the bad actions. And I found Subhanallah. And I found that from the good actions of my ummah was removing something harmful from the roadway. Removing something harmful from the pathway. And here we come back to an nahi al-munkar. What's the worst munkar that we could speak up about? Make noise about? say something about, I would say that it's something harmful in people's path, an obstacle in people's progress. What's the most important progress that anyone will make in their lives? The progress to their Creator. But what are the types of things that 
prevent someone from getting to their Creator, or learning about their Creator. We'll not uh, speak tonight about the misrepresentation of Islam uh, in uh, public media, but what about the statement of the Prophet والسلام, in which he said, كَادَ الْفَقْرُ أَيَّكُونَ كُفْرًا that poverty is almost disbelief. Now before we get excited hmm. and think that all of a sudden the Prophet والسلام, is preaching the American Protestant work ethic from the 1930s, right? Ah, wealth is next to godliness, right? And poverty is evil, and poor people are evil. No. Uh, there is a certain desperation that makes it very, very difficult for people to focus on anything but how to make ends meet. Here is an obstacle that prevents people from having a moment of tr tranquility or serenity in their deen. SubhanAllah. What are other types? Huh? If people, in order to drive their cars through certain... Because there's dangerous neighborhoods, right? In our society. We all have to admit that. And none of us like to drive through dangerous neighborhoods, or maybe some of us are not really thinking about it, are not really worried about it. There are those among us who are very concerned about driving through dangerous neighborhoods, right? And sometimes for some people who have achieved a certain degree of success in life, the very nice and fine neighborhood where they own their homes and drive good cars, is a dangerous neighborhood, is their neighborhood. They pay taxes in that area. Uh, they may even be on the homeowners association for that neighborhood, but if they get caught driving in certain circumstances through their very own neighborhood, a university professor married to a surgeon from Newark, New Jersey, and Asbury Park, New Jersey, could be asked to exit her car for no good reason, a Mercedes SUV at gunpoint. And she's a university professor at one of the most prominent universities in the country for driving in her own neighborhood. Because there's dangerous neighborhoods in this country. And it's not safe for some people to drive through some of these neighborhoods. And they've done nothing wrong. SubhanAllah. Maybe we need to rethink what a dangerous neighborhood is. And if we reach a position in, of influence in our society, in our town, what have you, and we're able to influence policy in that town and in these neighborhoods, then maybe we need to use that influence to influence the police force to serve and protect everybody, all citizens all guests, and think first, right? Because there's some dangerous neighborhoods in the society. Huh? And maybe you didn't realize that you live in a da dangerous neighborhood. Just like other people who live in no, uh, low-income neighborhoods, never occurred to them that their neighborhood is considered a dangerous neighborhood. SubhanAllah. We need to be more alert and have more self-awareness and think three times and listen two times before we open our mouths and say things. But we learn and life is all about learning because your soul craves completion. So getting back to the removal of obstacles from the, tar from the tariq, we talk about activism or being an activist. Well, tell me the philosophy of your activism. Tell me what drives you when we know that the ultimate aim and purpose of Islam, the maqasid of the deen of Islam, are two. The maqasid of the sharia of Islam are five. That's a different thing. They're not theological objectives. 
The theological objectives of Islam are two, to know Allah and to adore Allah, to be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the two. So then where does our activism come in? All of this, you know, working, for example, to help um, the rights of undocumented workers, or whatever it might be that is motivating us or driving us. Is there no place for that in Islam? Or do we need to restructure Islam in order to make a place for these things that are seem to be more important to people's practical lives and Islam is impractical if we say that the ultimate objectives of Islam is to ma'rifatillah wa ibadatillah? No, of course not. We just need to listen to Islam more. Because all of these other things, being an undocumented uh, person here in the United States and the difficulties and worries and fears uh, that go on with that when a person is just looking for a way to live. And at the end of the day, California was originally Mexico anyway, so yeah, you need to reassess who's an immigrant in this country, or at least out here in the West, mm, Texas, uh, what is it, Nevada, right? What's that, Arizona, right? That's I mean, come on, that's like really Mexico, so. But, uh, I would not even speak about First Nations, but those items that we would engage in in order to help people's lives or uh, bring an end to human trafficking or get extricate uh, people from uh, a human trafficking situation, are they anything other than imatatul adha on a tariq? Than removing a harmful obstacle from a person's path in life. And you don't guide who you wish to guide. Allah guides who He will guide. Your job is to make good decisions and spread goodness in the world. Huh? Not to decide who's going to become a Muslim or not. So your removal of obstacles in people's lives that may allow them to live a life where they can think about something beyond just how am I going to pay the rent this month? How am I going to make sure I'm not put out on the street this month? How I've seen situations where Muslims are jeopardizing the residency permits of other Muslims and if they get taken by authorities they will be deported to a war zone where they've already seen their own house targeted and destroyed on purpose on YouTube and people because it's inconvenient for them or they have other objectives don't want to know don't want to care Subhanallah. It all becomes a whole, it's all an ecosystem. MashaAllah. Look at the emphasis in this chapter on the idea of goodness in Islam. There's a very long chapter in Riyadh al Salihin, and in it are certain markers or clues or signifiers that indicate the purpose of life in the worldview of Islam. To spread good in the earth. That's why you're here. That's what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is clearly looking for from you. You are called upon to be a person who looks for the liberation of human souls. You are called upon to be a person who's bringing more good than otherwise in the space that you occupy in your life and in your world. That's one of the things it means to be a believer. We can identify as ethnically Muslim. Fine, that's great, that's a wonderful thing. Allah protects you and Allah supports you. Hmm? And we can also, on top of all of that, be believers, be muhsineen, 
and have an even higher calling in life that differentiates you from others. And let me tell you one thing, that if this is where you're ready to be, if you're ready to accept a calling, and we call it a calling, a mission, and you've been commissioned with this mission, but think of it as a calling when you hear the echo of the ahadith that are reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that depending on the strength of the chain, we may very well be able to say we're certain that he called out one day and said, my followers will be these types of people and these types of people. This is what I want to see Muslims doing in the world. Here is the purpose of life. It's as if Allah's Messenger والسلام, calls to you through the Senate. Like that game we used to play when we were kids, when you are somebody made us play it, we really didn't choose that game to play, but someone had the idea that let's take two empty cans and tie a string between them and you put it to your ear and someone talks and, and you know, maybe you can hear it okay and clearly, but it's as if the Senate works like those two cans and that string. And you can hear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling you who you are telling you who you're meant to be. And you may have like a moment in your life, or a period of time in your life, or a phase that you go through in your life, when you're really trying to figure out, what is my calling? Or who am I? Or who am I meant to be? Or what does all this mean? And just like the telephone line, huh, or the connection, Sometimes there's interference on the connection and you can't quite hear clearly or the message isn't getting through. But if you keep or insist on staying connected, keeping the line alive, when it's your time in Allah's design, the message is going to come through. From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loud and clear. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say that the Qur'an is Allah's communication with His creation. Okay, let's stop saying it and let's be quiet. And then let's listen to what He's saying to us. And consider it in the terms of our life. Not a tilawa that we do or that we perform. MashaAllah. Not in uh, principles of tajweed uh, that we make it kind of. Masha Allah. Not a book that we pull off the shelf and recite just because it makes my heart feel better or makes my parents happy when they see me do it and I'm about to ask them to do something for me, right? Or a performance that we do mechanically or habitually, but listen. And that's the tadabbur of the Quran, the contemplation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to you. The more we learn about this deen, the more that we learn about how it works, the more principles of the disciplines of the sacred sciences that we actually make an effort at some period of our lives to imbibe, the more we're going to get out of that recitation of Qur'an the more understanding we're going to get from the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ when we read them, when we contemplate the meaning of deen, when we listen to a khutbah on Friday. The more thaqafa that we have of the deen, the more Islamic literacy, the more depth we have in our Islamic literacy, the more we get out of that and the fewer mistakes of interpretation we make the more expanded our horizon becomes of possibility in this deen. And there are people in your life right now who are already Muslim or could become Muslim in the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that needs you to expand your boundaries, to expand your ability to hear through that chain of transmission and make sense of it 
in someone's life, in your life, in your conduct. We don't want to be like the Bedouin Arab who was so taken with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and the Prophet only. Just us two. Right? He had a very narrow or limited, uh, he had a scarcity philosophy of the world. Some people have a scarcity philosophy. They think that there's not enough to go around. He said, make dua to Allah that he have mercy on you and me only, not anybody else. And the Prophet ﷺ said, You've tried to constrict something that is so expensive. And this deen can heal so much. You want a health care plan? Right? This is a PPO. It's not an HMO. Right? Islam is not an HMO. You can, uh, there's a lot there. Right? There's a lot of treatment available for all different types of people in all different situations that they get in. It's there. It's just our abilities to think through and reason through and see and visualize and envision the possibilities of, of resolutions and solutions to the constrictedness or the narrow, narrow moments in people's lives that could either make possible or prevent. And that is a uh, public service announcement for why people should study more. Right? SubhanAllah. The next hadith. Ah, so he continues. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I saw that from the bad deeds of the Muslim was even a uh, mucus or phlegm that they may spit in the masjid and not make the effort to bury it. Literally what the hadith says. Okay? Why? Because there were no carpets in the masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? It was very, very fine gravel. Right? or sand, what have you, or a mixture of both, and it wasn't considered necessarily to be the worst thing. If someone spit in a situation like that, they didn't take their shoes off at the door. That's something that we do for good reason. So we want to keep the carpet clean. Right? We can't just you know, rake the sand like a nice Japanese garden, right? and then mashallah, it's all perfect again. Huh? So we take care of it, we like cleanliness, and we don't want to track najasa or filth into our homes or into the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, so if a person spit phlegm, he literally says nukha'a. And you know what in Syrian dialect is the same word they use for brain. Did anybody ever eat brain? No? For those who are always, like, live in America, I don't mean what you think I mean. Right? Right? It's the Muslims out there, they do eat brains, but it doesn't mean that it's the zombie apocalypse, where they came from, right? So, the, the Syrians use the word nukha'a, which really means mucus and phlegm, and, you know, the words that we use to describe that. SubhanAllah, from the bad deeds of his ummah is included, huh, for someone to blow their nose on the floor of the masjid, and not make an effort to clean it up. That's filthy. Is it najasa? No, it's not najasa. It's just filthy. From the bad deeds of this ummah is for people to bring their filth and spit it up in the masjid. And where were we at the beginning of the chapter? If you can't do this and you can't do this, then just to kufu an sharraka, to kufu nasa an sharraka. Protect the people from your own filth, from your own evil, from your own badness. Don't spit it all up in the masjid. Because, yes, the masjid is a place for healing. It's a place for healing all of those things that ail us. But anyone who's ever 
been in the hospital for a long time or had a loved one in the hospital for a long time in shared rooms and so on, people have to observe a little bit of neighborly etiquette with one another. Everyone's sick here and everyone's going through their own difficulties with their treatment, but the best neighbors to have in your hospital room for you or your loved one are the ones who are doing their best to kind of, you know, contain their situation so you can get through your situation. They're not over there trying to vomit on the person next to them. So let's see what we can do here in the masjid and try not to be the person, right, who's over there blowing their nose all over the masjid, blowing their junk and their filth huh, and their shove all over the place. Have a little bit of control. Have a little bit of cur courtesy, right? Be conscientious, right? Be conscientious. Then we can have beautiful houses of Allah, where people can come and find Allah. Because when they get out of control, they just come and they find everybody's filth and bad behavior. Right? It's an unclean, so we don't have any Syrians from Damascus here. Where I talk about uh, Meshva Mu'asat, right? the children's hospital at, uh, at Sahat al Mu'asat. So we, there were some nice hospitals in Damascus. The best healthcare I've ever seen in my life was in Damascus. But there are some hospitals that are not all that great, that unless you know better, you don't want to go to those massages. Once Muskeen Salah got real sick, we took him to the children's hospital. I wasn't, this is like before, you know, cell phones in Syria and that type of thing. I wasn't able to contact any of our circle of physicians, so I took him straight to um, Meshva Muasa, the children's hospital there at the bridge. SubhanAllah, all you had were just group rooms with bare, like, tables with some ripped up naga hide, you know, mat on the top, and there were no bed sheets, blankets, or pillows unless you brought bed sheets, blankets, and pillows. There were nurses, but they're not going to lift a finger to help you. The hallways were full of blood and bandages, used bandages, there were syringes on the floor, and people are in that situation trying to get their kids treated, hoping a doctor might come by, right? Hoping the doctor might come back, you know? But everyone's begging the nurses to do something, to help them out with a little something, and, you know, if you bribe them well, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do well, but if you're young and you haven't figured out how the bribery situation works, right? But that, you know, you're going to probably leave with more sickness and disease than you went in with. SubhanAllah. Let's not let our masajid be such places. Right? Inshallah, they're not. Because the purpose of the Muslim in the earth is to be someone who brings about good, who circulates good. And provide spaces where people's hearts can find their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a little bit of tumatnina, a little bit of sakina, a little bit of tranquility. This is our business, this is our calling as believers. SubhanAllah. Because people are going through enough in their world and enough in their life. You can be a sanctuary for other people, just like sometimes you need a sanctuary. Because it all comes full circle. The good you do for others will ultimately come back to you. According to Allah's design, who promises in the Qur'an that He will not allow the effort of any male or female go to waste, be left unnoticed, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it. Don't be swept away by the pettiness of people who are lost in life. Don't be swept away by that, because there's nothing to it except for misfortune. It's like the foam on the surface of the water. Huh? It's like the flotsam and the jetsam and the debris that floats on the surface of floodwaters. It can't help itself and it can't hurt itself. It just goes with the flow. But as for the foam, on the flood waters, it will dissipate. And Allah says, what will benefit the people will remain in the earth. And that's you, and what you're all about, and the calling that's there for you to take up. 
if you choose to be that person, but it's not easy, and that some days are hard. You know you want to be the positive one, and some days it's not that easy to be positive. But you've got to power through it, inshallah, you have a brother or a sister huh, who helps you along the way. But you've got to be the one to help them along the way when they're in need of someone. And there'll be times when you're all alone, and all of it is designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah give you all support. Allah give you all tawfiq. Allah give us all enlightenment and understanding and a little bit of thabat and a firm foothold to see good decisions, to see right conduct. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. There have come to you insights from your Lord. So whoever gains insight, it is to his benefit, and whosoever is blind, it is to his detriment. Allahumma bestow your blessings upon our master Muhammad and upon his family and companions and give them peace. Overturner of hearts and eyes, make our hearts firm on your deen. Director of hearts, direct our hearts to your obedience. Allahumma inspire in me my best direction and protect me from the bad within me. Allahumma I seek refuge in you from a bad day, from a bad night, from a bad moment, from a bad friend, and from a bad neighbor in the eternal home. Allahumma by your knowledge of the unseen and your power power over creation. Enliven me so long as you know life is best for me, and take my soul when you know death is better for me. Allahumma imbue me with shyness before you, in private and in public. Empower me within me a voice of truth in contentment and anger, and I ask you for moderation in wealth and poverty. I ask of you a blessed life without depletion, a delight of heart that never ceases, I ask you to give me contentment following your decree, and I ask you for a cool and pleasant life after death, and I ask of you the pleasure of looking upon your generous countenance, and a longing to meet you, free of any harmful damage or confusing crisis, Allahumma beautify us with the grace of faith, and make us resourceful and well-guided guides, Allahumma I seek refuge in you from a heart without trepidation in your presence, and from a prayer that is unheard, from an ego never satisfied, from knowledge without benefit, and from a request left unanswered, and Allah bless our master Muhammad and his family and companions and grant them peace.